Good evening, everyone. My name is Amanda Thomas, and I would love to welcome you to Science on Tap Online. We're here for the first time in 2021. We're very glad to be back. And we are here with uh, Janice Nimura, who is going to be talking about The Doctor's Blackwell, how two pioneering sisters brought medicine to women and women to medicine. And I, I have a, my copy of the book here. I have read it. It's very good. When we were just talking about um, having a, a chat before the event started, Janice mentioned that she just heard today or yesterday that it will be on the New York uh, New York Times bestseller list next week. Um, so that's very exciting. We're very pleased to have her here this evening. Um, just a quick note, if you are interested in picking up this book as well, I would highly recommend that you check out our uh, local to Portland bookstore, Broadway Books, and you can just go to broadwaybooks.net. They are offering a 15% discount on this book through February 10, and uh, you can use the code STBLACKWELL15. Um, if you don't get this written down right now, if you just go to our website or our event page on Facebook, you can um, see that there and, and get that code as well. So again, check it out, order it through Broadway Books if you can, and um, they have some signed plates uh, uh, where Janice has signed those, and those will be in the books as well for the first folks who buy them. Just a quick note for those of you who are new to Science on Tap, we are a group based in uh, Portland, Oregon, and we've been running events in the Portland metro area since about 2014. We obviously moved our events online uh, in April, and we uh, have been doing a ton of events. We did like 30 last year. We're going to be doing at least two events per month um, in 2021, and uh, so keep an eye out for us because we have a lot of really fun things coming up. If you want to see what we have done in the past, please check out our YouTube channel, Science on Tap ORWA. You can see the, I just took the screenshot today. Um, it has all of our previous events. It also has our podcast episodes. Our podcast is called A Scientist Walks Into a Bar. And uh, you can see both of those on, uh, on our YouTube channel. You can also find our podcast on all your favorite podcast apps. So we have a lot of great science content that is all free and available to you um, wherever you want to find it. With that, I am going to stop sharing my screen and welcome our speaker, Janice Nimura. Hey, so nice to see you. I'm going to share my screen and get my pictures going. There we go. All right. Um, so greetings, everyone in the Pacific Northwest. I so, so wish that I was among you instead of here in New York City. Um, uh, Boy, this is one of those nights where the virtual thing is just making me a little bit sad that I can't be sharing all this together with you. Uh, thanks for thanks for being here. Um, so Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell. Um, you may be familiar with the name Elizabeth Blackwell there on the left, uh, usually followed by the phrase first woman doctor. She was the first woman in America to receive a medical diploma in, in 1849, 1849. Um, her sister Emily, five years younger, followed her in her footsteps to become the third woman to receive an American medical degree in 1854. And together they founded the New York Infirmary for Indigent Women and Children, and then the Women's Medical College of the New York Infirmary. So I encountered the Blackwell story for the first time about five years ago. And this was shocking to me because I grew up in New York in the city where they practiced. I grew up at a proudly feminist girls school um, as the math science kid, hit college intending to be pre-med. I, I was then seduced by the humanities, but I had that intention and I had never encountered them, um, which struck me as bizarre. Um, so I went hunting and, and tried to sort of chase them down and find out what they were all about. And when I started to do that, I discovered that the easiest place to find them was on the children's biography shelf. And in fact, when I asked other people, so have you heard of these Blackwell sisters? And they, if they had heard of them at all, they said, oh yeah, I had a book about Elizabeth Blackwell when I was six. Um, that was the most common thing I heard. And when you read those children's biographies, um, they, um, they had a certain sameness to them. There was always um, a slim, elegant young woman with a stethoscope bending solicitously over a grateful patient. This is a one from the 40s. Um, this is one from 
a middle grade version in, in my in my daughter's school library. Again, slim, elegant woman, stethoscope, grateful patient. Um, here's the children's book version, slightly perkier little thing, but again, the stethoscope is there. Um, these stories were sanitized. They were inspirational. They were kind of like lives of the saints. Um, and they were a little frustrating to me because as I started to go deeper into the archival material about the Blackwells, it was very clear that they left a tremendous amount out. Um, the Blackwells looked like this. Um, they were never photographed holding stethoscopes. And even if they had been in the 1840s and 50s when they would have been as young as the sweet young things in all of those children's books, uh, stethoscopes looked usually like this. So there was nothing particularly accurate about those children's books, except for the bare fact that Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell had been among the first women to receive medical degrees in this country. And I really wanted to know their whole story and not just what fit in a picture book or on a plaque. So what is that story? Um, briefly, the Blackwells, eight out of the nine Blackwell siblings were born in Bristol, England in, eight, uh, in the 1820s. Um, they came to America as children in 1832. They were the children of a paradox, a man who had made his money in the sugar industry as a sugar refiner and who spent most of his free time um, giving his free time to the abolitionist cause, a sugar refiner who was an abolitionist. Think about that for a second. Um, he had profited from the very commodity that was based on enslaved labor. Um, and he was a dreamer. He dreamed of finding a way to make his commodity sugar from sugar beets instead of cane and without enslaved labor. And on the strength of that dream, he moved his family from Bristol all the way to America via New York and then all the way out to the remote frontier town, at the edge of the known universe to Cincinnati. Um, and then he died, broke, basically before they had finished unpacking, leaving his wife and nine children raising an age, ranging in age from late teenager to newborn with $20. His final lesson was basically that uh, a husband was no guarantee of security and none of his five daughters ever married. Um, he did give them some gifts though. He, as, as, a, as a dissenter from the Church of England was a very progressive minded man, uh, gave his daughters the same education as his sons. Um, Elizabeth was born in 1821 next Tuesday, this coming Tuesday is her 200th birthday, February 3rd. Uh, she was voraciously brilliant, socially quite awkward, uh, blessed with a healthy sense of self-esteem. Um, she admired the transcendentalist writer, Margaret Fuller, um, writer and editor, who at that moment in the 1840s, when, she, when Elizabeth was coming of age, uh, Margaret Fuller had, was the author of a bestseller called Woman in the 19th Century. And this book, argued that women could be anything they wanted to be by virtue of their own talent and toil, had nothing to do with sex. Women could be sea captains if they wanted to. And in Margaret Fuller's argument, um, humanity would not achieve enlightenment until women unleashed their own power and proved what they could do. Elizabeth was captivated by this idea and she had enough self-esteem that she really saw herself as someone whose life could prove Margaret Fuller's point. She, she really felt like her achievements might be able to be a beacon to lead people toward the light. So she chose medicine, not because she loved science, not because she loved taking care of people. She didn't really like people. Um, she thought sickness was a sign of weakness. She thought bodily functions were disgusting. She wasn't really interested in healing people. Um, but medicine in this moment was an unusually clear way to prove the point that she wanted to make about what women could do. Medicine in this moment in the 1840s was redefining itself, both scientifically and institutionally. To this point, um, medicine in the 1840s looked a lot like medicine had looked in antiquity with Galen and Hippocrates and the humors and wet and cold and hot and dry and having all those things in balance, which, which, which would lead to health. Um, hitherto, it had been, been considered more of a trade, uh, the trade of midwives and barber surgeons. Um, 
village doctors who became doctors because they apprenticed to other village doctors. But increasingly in America, um, it was becoming a profession, a profession of men, um, and a profession of men who proved that they had credentials by going to a medical school and receiving a diploma. There were increasingly medical schools in America. So Elizabeth thought to herself, if I can find my way into a medical school and sit through all the lectures and pass all the examinations, who can argue that I'm not just as qualified to be a doctor as any man? And the fact was that medical school was not a rigorous prospect. It was not the uh, intense you know, challenge that it is today. Um, as the mother of a pre-med college student, I, I am increasingly aware of the challenge, the intellectual and academic challenge that medicine has become. Um, medicine in 1847, when Elizabeth Blackwell entered medical school, was a matter of two identical 16-week terms. You went to school for 16 weeks and sat through lectures. That's all you did. If you were lucky, maybe you got to watch a dissection. If you were really lucky, you got to try one yourself, but you never interacted with living patients. Um, you did that for 16 weeks. You headed off for the summer to um, find some practical training somewhere. And then you came back and did it again, identically. Um, this was not really challenging. And, and moreover, the, the boys who, who went to medical school tended to be the ones who weren't smart enough to study the law. So Elizabeth being quite a brilliant um, reader, thinker, writer, really didn't th see that part as much of a challenge. And she thought, well, if I can find my way into a medical school, I've got it made. Um, so she did. She found her way after many, many, many rejections and lots of appalled laughter from um, most medical schools. She found her way to Geneva Medical College in Geneva, New York, in the Western part of New York State up in the Finger Lakes. Um, Geneva College has since evolved into Hobart and William Smith Colleges, if you're familiar with that. Um, she found her way there. If you read her memoir written decades later, um, the story she tells there makes it sound like a foregone conclusion. You know, she, she, she was rejected, but she persisted and finally she was accepted and she went. Uh, the reality was a little bit more of a farce. What really happened, we're told, is that she had been studying privately in Philadelphia with a sympathetic doctor um, who wrote her a letter of endorsement um, to back up her application to Geneva Medical College. And so when the faculty at Geneva received her uh, query about coming to their school, and it came with this prestigious letter from this doctor, um, they weren't quite brave enough up at Geneva to say no, out of hand. Um, they weren't quite brave enough to reject this, this prominent doctor. Uh, so they punted and they sent this, the question of whether Elizabeth could come to the students. And they said, students, um, this is up to you, but if any one of you has any qualms about this, she won't come. Thinking, okay, well, this will put the kibosh on Elizabeth Blackwell. The students, being a raucous, boisterous bunch, uh, immediately recognized two things. One, that their professors were cowards, and two, that they had an opportunity to make mischief. Uh, so at the meeting of the students that night to decide the question, um, anyone who had any objections was basically bludgeoned into submission. And the next morning, the students uh, gave their triumphant, unanimous decision to the faculty and promptly forgot all about it. They, they assumed it was a, a prank cooked up by a rival medical school. Um, and they, it slipped their minds until three weeks later when Elizabeth Blackwell walked into the lecture hall. That's the uh, original medical department building on the left. It no longer stands, but on the right there is the spot in Geneva, New York, where it was. Um, Elizabeth, once admitted, um, actually took some unexpected pleasure in working on specimens and with other people rather than just from textbooks. And she quickly impressed her professors and her fellow students. Um, the townspeople weren't quite as eager to accept her. They thought any woman who wanted to study the functions of the body in the same room as men must be either wicked or insane. Um, so she stayed pretty close to the college once they had accepted her there. In between her terms, remember she had to go and find some practical experience somewhere, she went back to Philadelphia and found her way to Blockley Almshouse, which was at that point the largest and oldest municipal hospital in the country. Um, it was 
you know, a, a place of last resort for the critically ill and destitute. Um, it was not a great place to, it was a great place to study illness, but it was not a great place to study healing. Um, she found her way to a room just off the syphilis ward uh, and settled into more, after having no exposure to patients at the, in, her, in her first term of medical school, she suddenly had more exposure to patients than she knew what to do with. Um, and immediately though, she, she showed some interesting instinct when it came to um, recognizing what the state of medicine was. This was a letter that she wrote to her sister, Marion, when she got there. Um, you know, she's here she is in the syphilis ward. I'm not afraid of sickness myself, but it is very certain if I should be ill, none of their nostrums would go down my uncontaminated throat. I should trust to fresh air, cold water, and nature, and live or die as the Almighty pleases. So she had this, this instinctive mistrust of this, of the antique kind of heroic medicine, which basically involved, um, you know, bleeding, blistering, emetics, enemas, uh, all the things that would make things come out if there was bad things inside. She distrusted that. Um, so being at Blockley also taught her instantly a lot about the connections between poverty and disease. And this was really her first uh, exposure to the idea of public health. Um, I'm assuming since this is a science on tap audience that you all have strong stomachs and interests in, uh, in, in bodily functions. So, um, this, this, if you're if you're triggered by by graphic um, medical diagrams, look away for this slide. Um, she, I, I mentioned she was off the syphilis ward. If you were in the hospital for tertiary syphilis in 1848, you were in bad shape. Syphilis did horrifying things um, in its late stages, including necrotic lesions to the skull and the face. There was a condition called saddle nose, in which your the bridge of your nose would fall in. Um, she was off a ward full of women suffering from this level of the disease. Um, and she quickly learned a lot about um, the connection between poverty and disease, not, not the, 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 the common thinking of the time was that especially venereal diseases were the result of bad behavior, not necessarily amoral germs. Um, she was starting to be exposed to these ideas and, and, and be able to, to ponder them in a very graphic way. Um, the other thing she was exposed to at Blockley Almshouse was epidemic typhus because it was 1848 and waves of Irish immigrants were arriving um, infected with what was then called ship fever. She chose this as her thesis topic for graduation from Geneva College. Um, it was published, which was extraordinary for a woman. Um, she, I think, probably consciously chose a topic that wasn't gendered. Um, she didn't choose to write about obstetrics. She chose to write about epidemic typhus. Um, and returning to Geneva after her summer at Blockley Almshouse in Philadelphia, she graduated at the top of her class. Um, then she needed some practical training, some more. So she did what a lot of newly hatched doctors in America did at that time, which was to go to Europe. Um, because European capitals uh, were much more robust centers of medical learning than anything America had to offer. She went to Paris and she landed here at a public maternity hospital called La Maternité, which um, was a training hospital for midwives from all over France um, who came as young women untrained uh, and became students there. Um, and she made the unusual decision, even though she already had an MD, to become a student there for the benefit of all the obstetric cases that she would be able to see. Um, continuing her exposure to the idea of poverty and disease, public health, um, she encountered a catastrophe here um, in her, this is, you know, this is Elizabeth is now six months out from earning her, her medical degree. She's 26 years old. Um, she's alone in Paris and in this um, convent where she's helping birth babies and take care of them, a lot of them being the children of prostitutes, because if you were giving birth in a hospital in the 1840s, you didn't have enough money um, to give birth at home. A lot of the women she was treating were infected with gonorrhea, and when a baby is born to a gonorrheal mother, 
in passing through the birth, con birth canal, it can contract gonorrheal conjunctivitis, an eye infection. Um, Elizabeth was tending to one of these babies early one morning when some of the liquid she was using to syringe its infected eye splashed into her face and she contracted gonorrheal conjunctivitis, um, which today would be treated easily with antibiotics, but then was a crisis. So she was quickly confined to bed in the very hospital where she had been working. Um, and for weeks, the, the question of whether she would retain her sight hung in the balance. Um, this is a good moment to pause um, and talk a little bit about the, the, the challenges of biography and how you tell a story when there are multiple accounts of the same episode. Um, in Elizabeth's memoir, she talks about this, this terrifying moment in her life um, with reference to the wonderfully named Dr. Hippolyte Bleu, who was one of the attending physicians at La Maternité, a friend of hers, um, very easy on the eyes, I might add, um, uh, who tended to her when she was ill. Um, she writes in her memoir, ah, how dreadful it was to find the daylight gradually fading as my kind doctor bent over me and removed with an exquisite delicacy of touch the films that had formed over the pupil. I could see him for a moment clearly, but the sight soon vanished and the eye was left in darkness. It almost sounds like a romance novel. Um, a different reality uh, came from a different source. So at, at the moment where um, Elizabeth fell ill, her, her eldest sister, Anna Blackwell, happened to be in Paris at the same time. Now, Anna was a class A drama queen, a hypochondriac and a journalist. Um, and she was helping to tend at her sister's sickbed. Um, she wrote about what was happening to Elizabeth like this. This was her description of Elizabeth's infected eye. Again, um, close your ears if you're not into gross des descriptions of medical situations. Um, the pupil presents just now the appearance of one of those little misshapen blackberries of three granulations and half dried up that one sees so often on some scrubby little bush. If you can fancy one such in dull looking lead, you have just the appearance of that poor eye. Ah. So, you know, this is my challenge as somebody who's going into all the sources to try and tease out um, what really happened and, and, and who to listen to at what, at what points. So Elizabeth um, recovered the sight in one eye and eventually lost the other and was fitted for a glass prosthetic. If you squint hard at this photo, you can see that there's an asymmetry in her gaze, uh, although she never discussed it. And a lot of people who encountered her never knew that she only had one eye, but it was something that redirected her even more strongly toward the idea of public health rather than practicing medicine. She could really no longer do surgery or fine work. Um, even reading was sometimes a challenge. So this, it, this sent her more strongly in the direction that she was already going, which was to think about, um, uh, thinking, about thinking about medicine rather than doing it. Um, here's another picture of her a few years later with her affected, the, the affected side of her face turned away from the camera. Um, I think that I think that was interesting. Uh, she wasn't quite used to, to her new look yet. Um, so she finished her training in Paris, had her one eye, did not go back home to convalesce or, or commiserate with her family. She went on to, to London to continue her training at St. Bartholomew's Hospital. Um, and in London, she had an, a fortuitous convergence with this woman, Florence Nightingale, uh, who in 1851, when they first met, uh, being introduced by a mutual friend, um, Florence Nightingale was not yet Florence Nightingale. She was uh, a young woman with big ideas, chafing against her wealthy family's insistence that she get married. Um, and here is Elizabeth Blackwell, who arrives sort of like this comet. And to Florence Nightingale, this is an extraordinary encounter because as she's chafing against her family's stuffy middle classedness, um, here's this woman, Elizabeth, who has received a medical degree, left her family behind, is pursuing practical training alone in Europe. Um, it, it, this is in deeply inspiring to Florence Nightingale. And they have this really sort of rapturous communion where they, they hit it off and spend days together discussing public health and hygiene and the role of women in this field. And then they hit a snag. 
which lasts the rest of their lives, which is that they fundamentally disagree on what a woman in the field of health should be. Florence Nightingale firmly believed that women were meant to be nurses. And Elizabeth Blackwell was determined to prove that women could be doctors. Uh, and they never converged on that point. And it became kind of something that um, came between them and, and, and sort of drew them together and forced them apart over and over again throughout the course of their lives. Um, so at, the, at this point, Elizabeth decides that she will now return to, her, to, to America and, and settle in New York and, and hang out a shingle uh, and, and see private patients and offer women the chance to be treated by a, a fellow woman. Um, it'll be great, right? So she gets to New York and it's not so great because in New York in the early 1850s, um, the, the very phrase female physician does not connote bright young woman with a medical degree. It really means somebody like Madame Restel, the notorious Fifth Avenue abortionist um, seen here in a caricature that compares her to a baby eating demon. Um, female physician to most people in New York in this moment would have meant abortionist, someone operating in the shadows on the wrong side of the law. Um, nobody would openly go consult someone who called themselves a female physician unless they were courting scandal. Um, this was dismaying. Uh, the private patients that Elizabeth Blackwell thought she was going to make her living from just did not show up. Um, so meanwhile, Elizabeth has anointed her younger sister, Emily, um, to follow her into medicine. She had recognized even before getting to New York um, that this was going to be a lonely path to pursue this woman in medicine thing. So she looked around, uh, identified her most intellectually talented sister, Emily, um, and said, hey, Emily, I think you should do this too. And Emily um, being the fourth Blackwell girl with several domineering older sisters um, who she was used to listening to, um, heeded her and actually took to the subject much more passionately than Elizabeth had. She actually had at least as much trouble finding her way into a medical school. Um, Elizabeth's example did not help her at all because the medical schools closed their doors even more firmly once they realized how well a woman had succeeded. Um, on top of this, women's medical colleges had started to open because there were other women who were interested in pursuing uh, medicine. Once there were women's medical colleges, uh, there was no reason for any men's college to admit a woman. They could say, why do you need to come here? Go there, those are for you. Um, but Emily and Elizabeth Blackwell really didn't believe that those women's colleges provided the same level of medical education. And so Emily hung in there, um, started at Rush Medical College in Chicago um, after her first term was politely invited not to come back because having women there was too uncomfortable for the trustees. And she managed to finish up at Cleveland Medical College, which has become Case Western. So in 1854, she had her degree and she too headed off to Europe to um, get her training. She went to Edinburgh where she sort of apprenticed herself to one of the most flamboyant and prominent um, physicians in Edinburgh, James Young Simpson, physician to the queen, the man who had discovered the anesthetic properties of chloroform, um, he was a big deal at the University of, at the University of Edinburgh. Um, he was sort of a showman. Um, he was a very prominent obstetrician and gynecologist, but he also was um, used to kind of surrounding himself with a parade of, of, of major figures of the day. And it seemed to me reading the sources that he kind of appreciated the shock value of having a female MD among his young assistants. Um, that said, he taught her a great deal. He was um, a, a, an early adopter and promoter of the idea of a pelvic exam, the, the diagnostic tool that all obstetricians and gynecologists use today. Um, he invented the, the instrument on the bottom there, Simpson's uterine sound that was used to measure the dimensions of the cervix. Um, above, that's a, that's, that, that's a pessary, which was used um, to support uterine prolapse when when women had had too many pregnancies and their uterus no longer stayed where it was meant to stay. Uh, this was a device that was inserted into the vagina um, to keep things in place. Um, Emily, learning at a, at a great rate um, in a practical way, um, wrote about all of this in letters home to 
languishing Elizabeth in, in New York, you can see the diagrams of the pessary and the sound on the left in this letter. Um, poor Elizabeth, deeply underemployed at this point, was avidly consuming everything Emily could teach her about what she was learning in Edinburgh. Um, you know, so this story, you know, if you've heard of the Blackwells of, at all, you've pretty much only heard of Elizabeth. A lot of people haven't heard of Emily at all. And from the start, it was really important to me to make this book the story of both of them, because it, I, I felt strongly that um, Elizabeth Blackwell would not have achieved what she achieved without Emily at her side. Um, however, the source material was a little bit thinner about Emily than about Elizabeth, because Elizabeth wrote more, was written about more. Um, so one of the things you can do as uh, someone who does this research when the sources are thin and one of the most fun things to do, I think, is to go there, um, go follow them around, do all the things they did and see what you can learn and deepen about your understanding of what their lives were like. So one of my favorite passages of the research in this, in this project was to go to Edinburgh and follow Emily around. Um, I went to 52 Queen Street, which was where James Young Simpson's house was, where Emily would have gone every day to assist in his consulting rooms. It was the only house in the row with an extra story because his household and his practice were just bursting at the seams. Um, when I went there and took this picture, I noticed that the door was open, as you can see, and in the spirit of following in the footsteps, um, I walked in. <laughs> it's, a, it's, an, it's not a private home, don't worry. Um, it's now a drug counseling center, so it wasn't totally trespassing. But walking in and walking around really gave me more of a flavor of what it would have felt like to be Emily in 1854, working with James Young Simpson, who was the kind of guy who had his initials worked into the banister <laughs> of his stairway. But um, Emily would have you know, held on to this banister as she went up every day. Um, I went to the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh, which I highly recommend if you ever find yourself there. It's a wonderful pathology museum. And it also had tons of artifacts from, from Simpson's practice. It had his pocket pill case there on the left that says, please return to 52 Queen Street on the, under the lid. Um, it had his monaural stethoscopes in ivory and rosewood down on the lower left there, the sort of trumpet-like things that people would use to take a pulse. Um, belt buckles and quill pens and even the decanter that he used to sample the chloroform when he discovered its anesthetic properties. Um, this is the kind of work that I love to do um, in order to sort of feel with all five senses what these people from 150 or 200 years ago felt. So that was Emily in Edinburgh learning a great deal at the really at the top of the game. Um, even so with all of this learning, um, the world wasn't ready for for to accept the idea of a female physician. Um, this is a cartoon from the satiric newspaper Punch in London, right about the time where Emily was getting ready to leave Edinburgh. It depicts Emily on the right in scandalous bloomers, the bloomer costume of the women's rights movement, squinting through spectacles with a rather mannish profile and a ridiculous hat at the only patient who would consult a woman doctor, which would be a lap dog, um, clutched in the arms of a beautiful wasp-waisted, more feminine, um, conventionally feminine woman. This is sort of um, how most people sort of chuckled and snarked about, about the idea of a woman doctor. So Emily comes back to New York and joins Elizabeth. Um, and at last, in 1857, they, um, they achieve a milestone. They open the New York Infirmary for Indigent Women and Children um, in a building that still stands. If you know New York City, it's in Greenwich Village at the corner of Bleecker and Crosby Streets. Um, they're on the right as it is now and on the left as it was. Um, this was the first hospital staffed by women. And its intention was not just to give the poor women of the neighborhood a chance to get free medical care from women, but also to provide a place for the slowly growing ranks of female medical graduates to have a place to train, to get that practical training that Elizabeth and Emily had struggled so to receive. Um, I was lucky enough um, to become friends with the woman who uh, owns the building and works in the building um, and was renovating the building. This is this is what the interior looks like. Um, if you if you happen to have read the book. Uh, or when you do read the book, the opening scene is the 
founding ceremony of the infirmary. And I believe that it, it happened here um, beneath these windows on the second floor of the building. Um, but it was very fascinating to get inside and see the original brickwork and the, the beams and, and really, again, feel what they would have felt being inside this building. I was actually privileged to write the chapter about the infirmary inside this building, which was a trip. Um, so, the, so we've gotten to about 1857 now, and what's America getting ready for then? Um, the Civil War. And of course, Emily and Elizabeth played a role. Um, 1861 in April, the first shots fired at Fort Sumter, um, and Elizabeth and Emily immediately call a meeting uh, of their donors and supporters, the people who have supported this venture of opening this infirmary. And they draft an appeal for the New York Times, which reads to the women of New York and especially to those already engaged in preparing against the time of wounds and sickness in the army. There was a huge amount of chaotic energy being directed toward the union cause and it needed to be channeled and, and, um, and, and made productive. So they drafted this appeal to run in the newspaper inviting women to come to Cooper Union, another building that still stands in, uh, in the East Village. Um, a gathering to make some decisions and get organized. And, and to this meeting came thousands of women, of the women of New York eager to help. And out of this meeting grew something called the Women's Central Association of Relief, um, which then eventually morphed into the US Sanitary Commission, the most important civilian organization of the Civil War. You could, if you wanted to draw a pretty straight line from Elizabeth and Emily's living room to the US Sanitary Commission. And they found themselves heading up the committee that was um, charged with vetting and training women to serve as nurses at the front. And the Blackwell sisters threw themselves into this work um, to a point um, because it became pretty clear fairly quickly and dismayingly that New York's male physicians were not interested in working alongside New York's female physicians. Um, they also, uh, as far as the war effort in Washington was concerned, um, went past the Blackwells and chose Dorothea Dix um, to lead the effort, a woman who was, had no background in medicine or health. Um, the Blackwells called her the meddler in chief. Um, they were dismayed and frustrated by the lack of um, response from their male colleagues. They were not being um, allowed to lead in the ways that they knew that they could. And so after a year of effort, they withdrew from the war effort and turned their attention to their next project, which would turn out to be um, opening a women's medical college. Now this is a little bit ironic because the Blackwell sisters really disdained women's medical, women's medical colleges. They believed that there was no need to segregate the sexes in medical education. Um, but as women's medical colleges opened and began to turn out what they thought were inferior medical graduates, um, they realized that if the men's colleges weren't going to change, they were going to have to change their minds and open a women's medical college that was more rigorous, certainly than the women's colleges and even than the men's colleges. And theirs uh, did that. It had a, it had it was three years instead of two. Um, it had courses that built on each other instead of just repeating. Uh, it had a much greater emphasis on practical training at the bedside because they, it grew out of their infirmary and they could teach that way. Um, that was op the, the, their first year, the, the college's first year was 1869. Um, and, and that was, in, in some ways, the end of their partnership as um, sister doctors. Um, once the Women's Medical College was founded, Elizabeth actually went back to England for the last 40 years of her life. She had always preferred to be there and she had always preferred the public health um, direction. Um, so she left Emily behind, went to England to pursue those things. And Emily remained in New York and ran the infirmary and the college successfully for. 40 years. Um, that was their, per their professional lives. Personally, they were almost as interesting. Um, some would maybe think more. Both sisters adopted daughters in two very different ways. Um, Emily lived for the last several decades of her life with her female partner, another fellow surgeon, Elizabeth Cushier. Um, two of their brothers 
married two of the most prominent feminists of the day. Um, Lucy Stone, who was an, a, a serious suffrage activist and Antoinette Brown, who was the first woman in America to be ordained as a minister. I would say that Henry and Samuel Blackwell were two of the first feminist husbands. Um, I think having been uh, well-trained by their very strong and professionally minded sisters. Um, however, the Blackwell sisters didn't agree with these sisters-in-law of theirs. In fact, they really looked askance at the women's movement, um, didn't believe in women's suffrage, um, had a lot of disagreements. It's a complicated story, not, not a straightforward story of feminist triumph. Um, Elizabeth and Emily didn't agree with each other very much either about what the proper role of a woman in medicine should be. As I said, um, Elizabeth was pursuing more of a public health role, more of a, a woman is a teacher armed with science doctoring role, whereas Emily was a practitioner and a surgeon and a medical professor and believed that the role of a woman in medicine was to be as good a doctor as any man. Um, they, uh, they parted with some relief and spent the, those, those last decades of their lives, you know, cordial but distant. Um, so that's the outline of, of the story. And, you know, in this moment, as we celebrate the inauguration of our first female vice president and all the, all the female cabinet members that are going into place right now, um, I think it's an important moment to, to think about heroines and, and how we need our heroines to be. And to me, that is summed up in this photograph. Um, if you Google Elizabeth Blackwell and you go to images, this photo will come up every time. It is on websites, it's been in documentary films, it, it has been on at least one biography that I've seen. Um, this is not a picture of Elizabeth Blackwell. You can tell because on the back, um, which gives the, uh, the, the details of the photo studio. Um, Dana's photo portrait gallery was not on 14th Street and 6th Avenue in New York until the mid 1880s when Elizabeth Blackwell did not look like this anymore. Um, she was in her 60s. This is probably one of her nieces, um, but I'm fascinated by the fact that it is a persistently misidentified photo that we on some level want our heroines to look like this to feel like this, this woman looks like, you know, a cousin of Joe March and Lizzie Bennett, you know, uh, a young Victorian about to overturn the world with her wit and intelligence. Um, but the Blackwells, as I said, looked like this. Uh, they weren't perky or pretty. Um, they were complicated, imperfect, very real heroines, uh, the kind of women who changed the world. And I think we all could stand to think hard about how we hold the things we admire and the things that are flaws alongside each other and simultaneously in, in, in the, and in the way we, we admire women. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I'd be very happy to, um, to, to take some questions. Should I unshare Excellent. my yeah, if you can. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. We have some questions and I have a bunch of questions um, as well, Excellent. but I'm going to start with some from the audience. And uh, Marilee asked specifically about how they felt um, about Samuel Thompson's botanic physicians movement. And I know that um, in the book, you also talk about the eclectic movement and, and other medical movements. Can you talk a little bit about right. their thoughts on that and right now describe a little bit about perhaps what allopathic is in contrast yeah right so this was a fascinating moment i mean it, the story is is happening on so many different levels because at the moment where the blackwells are deciding to you know inject women into medicine medicine itself is in is in chaos in some ways there are so many new ideas um all competing for attention um the thomsonians were a um Sorry, let me back up a second. This was the 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 last gasp of what was known as heroic medicine. Um, you know, uh, this idea that the role of the doctor, since since there was no good way to look inside the body, um, if there was something wrong, um, a, you could tell a good doctor because if if he came to your bedside and did something, 
something happened. <laughs> so if something was going wrong inside, it was the doctor's role to make something come out, whether that was blood or pus or urine or vomit or phlegm, whatever it was, um, a good doctor made things happen and tried every tool in his toolkit until you either died or got better. Um, and people were starting to realize that, that doctors were doing more harm than good often. Um, so all of these alternative therapies were starting to emerge. Um, heroic medicine being the allopathic and, and these new ideas, some of, them, some of them being homeopathic, others being um, variations on, on, on ideas that may or may not have had any, had any bearing in reality. It went from the, the questioner asking about Thompson was Thompson was, his whole approach had to do with heat. Um, and th there was a specific herb called lobelia that that he was especially fond of, and and his 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 remedies all had to do with regulating heat in the body. Um, other approaches were things like the water cure, where you drank and sweat and bathed as much as you could to purify the toxins inside. Um, other things like mesmerism and magnetism um, were you know further out on the fringe of the spectrum. Um, there were medical schools um, opening at the same time as the Blackwells were opening theirs that um, espoused a more botanical approach. They called themselves the eclectic medical schools um, using gentler botanical remedies. Um, and a lot of the ideas about cold water and fresh air that the Blackwells actually knew were a good idea. It's just, it's fascinating to watch because they were trying to break into a man's world, break into an establishment that didn't want them there. And if you're trying to break into the, to an establishment, you can't start out by criticizing the establishment. So they were trying both to work within the established old ways and try to sort of weave in these new ideas that they could see had merit, but were still being regarded as quackery. So they were kind of caught in, and you can, and it's fascinating in their letters, in their journals to watch them kind of working through this. How do I navigate between the conservative men and the more progressive ideas that I think might have merit? And then what about these crazy ideas? Could they have merit too? Does magnetism work? That kind of stuff, it, 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 it's, it's, fascinating to watch them thinking their way through that. Um, we tend to think now that we know, you know, we have medical answers. We don't. We're all still doing that. We're all still finding our way through. I'm sure that 100 years from now, chemotherapy will seem barbaric to the doctors of the future. So it, it's, it's a fascinating moment. I'd like you to talk a little bit more about the medical school experience. You mentioned just <laughs> briefly that, um, well, in the book, you, you describe how they went for two years, um, and but only a couple of months per year. And then I think you also said that they, they wouldn't do a sequence of classes. They would just repeat classes. So you can talk a little bit about what kind of schooling they would have gotten. Yeah, not much. I mean, even, even Elizabeth was very aware that when she uh, emerged, she had no idea what she was doing. And, and, and she was sort of appalled by her own ignorance. Um, they, you know, at a, at a provincial school like Geneva Medical College, they actually did have some anatomical specimens um, that some of the students were accused of trying to rob graves to get some more. Uh, you know, it was, it was sort of, sort of a Wild West um, approach to, to finding specimens. Um, what they were mostly doing, a, a, a medical school was basically a, a gathering together of medical professors, each with his own subject, each of whom would sell a ticket. You, so you would buy the pathology professor's ticket for the term, and you would buy the chemistry professors, and you would buy the, the pharmacology professors and the pathology professors, um, and you would collect all these tickets, and you would go to the lectures and basically sit and listen and take notes. Um, uh, you know, I, I loved reading Elizabeth's medical notes, you know, things like um, medicine is, you know, medicine meaning things like mercury, opium, you know, harsh, I, you know, dangerous drugs. Um, she would say, you know, medicine is, is 
is always an evil. Sometimes it's a necessary evil. And then she would write notes to herself about um, uh, a delicate woman should not be dosed like an Irishman. You know, the, 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 the incredibly rudimentary, um, very much groping in the dark kind of approach. And you can also see her thinking in her own thesis that she wrote about um, typhus. Um, she's, she can see that no one really knows why certain people are infected, how the infection is transmitted. No one really knows, everybody's just guessing. But at the same time, she's trying to be accepted by these men who don't really wanna to be told that they have no idea what they're doing. So she's constantly navigating this path. Oops. Whoops, sorry, I have there having some issues with the mute button. Um, speaking of kind of barbaric medical procedures, one of the things that, that really struck me uh, <laughs> was um, talking about applying leeches to the cervix. Was that right? <laughs> oh, we're going to go there, huh? Okay. Um, yeah, um, leeches, you know, leeches got a bad rap, right? Leeches, leeches are, are, are having a renaissance um, because they are still useful. Um, today they're used to, um, for, their, for their anticoagulant properties and, and as a way of debriding dead tissue and they're very useful. Um, then, um, you know, bloodletting was a major facet of, of medicine. If you had an inflammation, the idea was you had too much heat. Um, if you took some blood out, you could dissipate that heat. So if you had a big infection, you would take out a lot of blood. Um, if you had a, an, an, a, an ailment in the cervical area um, and bloodletting was one of the things that you wanted to try, you, it, it's hard to get in there with a lancet. So you go in there with a leech. <laughs> um, and the way they would do this, everybody's sure they're ready here. It's, I hope you've already had dinner. Um, is you would um, thread, put a thread through the leech's tail so that you could feed the leech into the cervix and then be able to pull it out again when it was engorged with blood. Um, and thanks for asking that, Amanda. <laughs> I'm sure everybody's really pleased. <laughs> you know, yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I figured we had to go there, so. Uh... <laughs> Um, Helen had a question about, uh, you mentioned that when their father died, that they, we were left with $20 and, and were not very well off. And <laughs> Helen was asking about how she had the resources to go to medical school or Elizabeth specifically, and then and Emily later, um, and also go to Europe several times. Good question. Right. A couple of different ways that was happening. Um, one is that Elizabeth and then Emily behind her um, took teaching jobs and, and saved and saved and scrimped. Elizabeth taught in Henderson, Kentucky and Asheville, North Carolina and Charleston, South Carolina, um, wherever she could find a place that needed, um, I think she was, she was teaching you know, sort of English and German in one place and she was teaching piano in another place, wherever they needed a, a teacher, she would go. And she was lucky in Asheville and in, and in Charleston to be teaching in places where she was boarding with a doctor who could, who could also be sort of tutoring her a little bit in medical issues. But she was scraping together money from teaching jobs and so was Emily. And then once they were underway, it was interesting, there was sort of an inversion in the Blackwell family. Um, when the father died, the three eldest children were girls and they were 17, 19 and 22 or something like that. Um, they all leaped into teaching jobs to support the family. And then their brothers gradually came up behind them and eventually were old enough to get jobs of, the, of their own. But I think there was some gratitude, some recognition on the part of these young men that their sisters had kind of saved the day um, for the family. They had kept the family afloat and respectable, kept the family together. Um, and there was some willingness on their part to support their sisters in their unusual pursuits. All five, as I said, all five Blackwell sisters remained single. Um, four of them pursued professional careers. Um, and luckily their brothers were holding steady jobs, first in Cincinnati and then in New York and Boston. Um, and were willing to, to fund them. 
later on, um, once they had, once Elizabeth and Emily had founded the infirmary in New York, um, they were working mostly with donations and grants from the city government and state government for, for their institutions. But they never had much money. Yes, uh, Barbara also asked a question about how do they get funding for the medical college, and you kind of just touched on that with grants and, yeah, and donations. Yeah, yeah, mostly donations. Yep. The there, Mary had a question about um, how did they adopt their daughters. You mentioned something that they mm -hmm. did them in in different they ways, did. and I, yeah, I when we were speaking before uh, we we got on the the event here, I mentioned that I was really shocked at how Elizabeth, in particular, adopted her daughter. Um, would you talk about that? Yeah, I'm glad we have a chance to go there because I skipped over it quick before. Um, so Elizabeth, in the middle of the 1850s, at that moment when she was languishing in New York um, and kind of struggling, not you know, struggling to eat sometimes because she didn't wasn't making any money from patients. Um, Emily was still off doing her training. She was lonely and 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 quickly sliding into some sort of depression. Um, so she. She went to the city orphanage and picked out an orphan, um, a young Irish girl, six or seven years old named Kitty Barry and took her home and talked about her in this sort of startling way where she was describing her as some, somewhere between a servant and a daughter and a fan. She sort of was clearly wanting company. She thought I can train this one up. She'll, she'll be useful around the house but she'll also be company. And that's sort of what happened. Kitty um, grew up sort of to be Elizabeth's acolyte. She was never uh, encouraged to marry or find her own career. Um, and she really was there to, to love Elizabeth. And, and she, she never called her anything but Dr. Elizabeth. Um, and Elizabeth sort of conveniently shunted her off to other family members when she was in the way but also depended on her to uh, provide this kind of this 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 kind of unconditional love and the support of a, of a help meet um, she was somewhere between daughter servant mate and and amanuensis um, it was a very strange relationship but it seemed to work um, emily after elizabeth moved back to england um, and uh, you know she was sort of creating her own household for the first time, um, also adopted a baby, but a baby um, who she named after her mother. Um, the baby called Emily Mama, um, you know, grew up to sign her letters with kisses and marry and give Emily four grandchildren a much more conventionally um, recognizable, you know, family arrangement. Uh, I think in general, I think Emily was uh, I, I had the sense always in the research that Emily was a was a more emotionally um, grounded person and had much an, a much easier time connecting to other human beings than Elizabeth did. We are uh, running just a tiny bit long, so I'm only going to ask a couple more questions. Though I do, I know that there are a bunch of questions that we haven't gotten to yet, so I want to encourage people to stick around um, afterward because Janice has agreed to stick to to stay on camera and answer some more questions um, once we're finished with the official event. But I'd like to talk a little bit more about something you you addressed towards the end of your talk about how. Um, th the the Blackwells and, and uh, Elizabeth in particular are not somebody, not people that I would necessarily feel are very likable. Um, and they're, they're not quite the, the typical heroine that you would expect to be the first, you know, woman doctor. And, and it seemed like she in particular and, and Emily to some extent, um, didn't really like women, other women very well, or they, they held them to a, an extremely high standard. And, and I wonder if you can talk about that kind of aspect of their lives and, and how we view women and, and scientists in history. Yeah, I, well, you, that's a lot, there's a lot in there. Um, let's see if I can tease some of that out. Um, uh, I think Elizabeth, as I said, you know, at the beginning, she, she came to medicine, not because she felt called to medicine, but because she felt called to um, help humanity. She wasn't really interested in helping individual people. She was interested in, in, in helping humanity. Um, so she wasn't 
particularly likable a lot of the time. She was um, extremely driven and extremely idealistic, um, held people to an ideological standard that was pretty impractical, um, really was always disappointed when people didn't live up to her ideological bar. But the fact was that the, the kind of barrier she was breaking was such an extraordinary one to break that you sort of had to be that driven in order to do that. And I think that's such an interesting part of the story is that you know there's this, there's this um, female misogyny going on all over the story and all over our, our current moment you know, if we if we are, are honest with ourselves, um, Elizabeth and Emily were working so hard to do this thing that was considered impossible for women that they were incredibly wary of other women whose you know uh, frivolousness might undermine or taint what they were achieving. You know, I always say, well, uh, Elizabeth was the first woman doctor and Emily was the third, which begs the question, well, who was the second? Um, the second was a woman named Nancy Talbot Clark, who actually received her degree from the same place Emily did just a little while later. She had the same, she had achieved the same thing, um, but the, the Blackwells always referred to her as little Mrs. Clark and not in a nice way, um, which was really striking to me, but also very familiar because I think we have all either been the perpetrators or the witnesses of moments where we weren't charitable to our sisters. Um, we were fighting to do something and we didn't want to have our credibility undermined. I think that's an, an incredibly um, prevalent thing that a lot of people um, have experience with and won't necessarily admit to. So I, I, I thought it was a very real aspect of this story. And, you know, in this moment where we're always talking about cancel culture and about, you know, people doing one, taking, making one misstep and, and being kind of erased, uh, I think the Blackwells are really important people to meditate on because they had this incredible achievement. And yet a lot of what they did um, wasn't perfectly admirable or, or you know, um, what we would like to see a, f a feminist being today. And I, I recognize my own culpability in saying, oh, well, this, this scientist woman in history, um, it, she wasn't likable enough. And, and what, what does it matter if she's likable or not? We're not necessarily talking about right. male scientists or doctors who are, you know, their, their personalities in, in that same way. So I recognize in my own self, but, but it was really striking to me in, in the book that that was called out a lot. Yeah. And it hurt her. I mean, I think Elizabeth, um, as the pioneer, um, ended up having a, a less fulfilling end game because um, she wasn't a collaborator. She didn't know how to build a team around her. And she ended up, I think, in, in, a, in a lonely place at the end of her life. Whereas Emily running these institutions um, was more of a team builder, was more of a, of a collaborator. As a, a final question for me, and, and then, like I said, we can stick around for some more questions just through the chat. Um, but a, a question that I've been posing to many of our speakers recently, and I'm going to twist it a little bit for you, but why do you feel it's important for people to learn about the history of science? Uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't study the history of science as a student. I studied the history of science as, as the researcher for this book. And, and what you come to realize very quickly is that the history of science is the history of how we think about our bodies in the world, about how we perceive our own power over biology, how we respond to the things that threaten our survival, how we think about life and death, really. Um, so think, you know, watching um, the history of medicine shift over those middle decades of the 19th century is really an extraordinary illustration of that. And then when you add on top of that, the, 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 the sex and gender question of the Blackwells were confronting and thinking, so this is a story about people thinking about bodies, but also then women thinking about men and men thinking about women, and it, it becomes very rich. But um, I think if I had to do college over again, I might pay more attention to the history of science department. 
Well, I find it fascinating, and I, I know that I, I suspect that the folks who are still sticking around in the chat um, also find it fascinating, and I encourage everyone. Um, I'm going to share my screen here for just a minute. Janice, stick around. Thank you for, for your anywhere. wonderful talk. Um, I Thank Let's see. Let's do this. I, whoops. Uh, there we go. Okay, um, I want to recommend this book, The Doctor's Blackwell. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, if you go through Broadway Books, uh, you can go to broadwaybooks.net. They are offering a 15% discount through February 10 if you use the code STBLACKWELL15. And if you, you can write that down now or that is on our event page on our website and our Facebook page and our meetup page. So you can find out that code there as well. Just one, a couple quick things. Wanted to let you know what is coming up next at Science on Tap on Wednesday, February 10. This is just in time for Valentine's Day. It is a special collaboration with the Portland Chamber Orchestra. So uh, the tickets are $10 um, and it's a fundraiser for both us, Science on Tap and the Portland Chamber Orchestra. But it is a, uh, a bringing together of the crew that, that put a, uh, a special Brain Chemistry for Lovers event together um, back in 2009. And so we'll be talking to those folks now um, and then also showing a video of some of the presentation, which it features uh, Valerie Day, who is a singer, talking, singing about love and, and how that affects your body. And then we'll have Dr. Larry Sherman there talking about the neuroscience of what's going on in your brain when you are in love. It's, it's a fun event. I encourage you to join us on Wednesday, February 10. Quick note, uh, thank you to our Patreon supporters. We have 122 of you folks who are donating at the, um, well, $122, or let me try that again, 122 uh, Patreon supporters in total. These are the folks who are donating $10 or more per month. You are keeping us alive. Thank you for being here. Um, and I want to say a special thank you to Carol Stewart, who is one of our Patreon supporters. And finally, um, before we get back to Janice's uh, more questions, Science on Tap, uh, aside from our event next, uh, our next event, which we're, we're charging a fee for, um, we do these events for free because we think it's important that people have an opportunity to learn how to learn about science and keep their brains active during these weird times. Um, but we need your support in order to continue to do this. So if you uh, want to join our Patreon uh, account, we would be very grateful for that. Or you can donate to us at make you think slash I'm sorry, make you think.org slash support and make you think is our nonprofit partner. So we're going to leave this screen up. If you feel so compelled to kick us five bucks or, or more, we would be super grateful. And I'm going to invite um, Janice back on screen and have you take a look through some of the, the chat and the Q and a and answer some questions. And I'll be kind of lurking in the background here. <laughs> 